Good morning. I greet you in the name of Jesus. I'm excited to be here this morning to share again on the spiritual gift of serving. Did some of you go home last time after I shared on the spiritual gift of prophecy and talk to each other and say, hey, I know who's a prophet. I know God has gifted me that way. Did some of you discuss some of that? Some of it makes sense to you? Do you know your spiritual gifts? How many of you know your spiritual gifts? Wow, so quite a few of you know your spiritual gifts. How many of you think you don't have a spiritual gift? <laughs> Some of you? How many of you think your spouse doesn't have a spiritual gift? I'm just kidding. I won't go there. We won't, we won't go into that part. But you know what? It's true. Everybody has a spiritual gift. Everybody has a gift given from the Lord for the edifying and the building up of the church. And I hope that as we go through these different spiritual gifts, that you're going to see, um, you know, either the people around you, you're going to understand the gifts that they have, so that you can identify with them, so you can understand why they sometimes do the things that they do, why they do some things that you think are weird, or you just don't understand, you can't enter into the things that they're doing. And I hope you understand your own gifting, why you respond in certain ways, um, especially as it pertains to spirituality. <clears throat> so the spiritual gift of serving. Somebody said this, I found this, I thought it was kind of neat. This guy says, my grandfather once told me that there are two kinds of people, those who do the work and those who take the credit. He told me to try to be in the first group. There was less competition there. And that makes sense to me. And, and I think if, if you can think of that a little bit, it makes sense to you too. Everybody wants the credit, right? But there's not as many people that want to do the work. And you know, in the church today, the spiritual gift of serving is one of the most needed gifts in the church. And, you know, I'm, I'm blessed because I know that in our midst here, we have many that have that gift. And, and I think our church is the better for it. But this is one of the gifts that I believe uh, is so needed. So needed in the church. And I, I hope you're able to identify with some of these things this morning. Uh, if you want to turn with me to John chapter 13, I want to demonstrate a little bit to you about the Lord Jesus. You know, you know Christ had a servant spirit about him wherever he went. And throughout his earthly ministry, you see his servant attitude. You know, he, he mentions that he came to give and he came to serve and not to be served. Um, and, and you know, you see throughout his ministry, you see this thought pattern coming out of his life, the way he relates to people, the way he talks to people, the way he gave of himself to people, so sacrificially all the time. Um, but in John chapter 13, he has just demonstrated something very powerful to his disciples. And he, he focused so much on his 12 disciples, and he, he does something very significant to them. As the, as the Lord and Master, as the disciple maker, as the shepherd, he submits himself to the role of a servant and he takes his towel and he washes the feet of the disciples there. And it was very, very profound. Maybe, you know, we've heard this so many times that it's not as significant to us anymore. But I want you to just enter into this scenario here because he did something that was unheard of. You know, in, in that society back then, the master would never do that to the servants. The master was above and beyond that. And he demonstrated something very unique to his followers there by showing a spirit of humility, uh, probably something they had never really observed in their lifetimes. And in John 13, verse 12, it says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? So he's appealing to them to enter into what he has just uh, accomplished there for them, what he has just completed. He says, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. So Jesus was promoting the gift of serving. 
he was demonstrating that as a believer, as a Christian, primarily our motivation and the best way to demonstrate a Christ-like attitude is not by taking, but by giving, by serving. Not by um, desiring the highest position, but being willing to submit to a low position. He was demonstrating one of the, the greatest character qualities that can be found in a believer, and that is humility, which is really lacking today, which is often uh, a great issue today in the church because so many want priority, so many want position or prestige, and there are so few that are willing to humble themselves and serve others. They're, they're, you know, it's so easy for us to look down on those who have maybe a lower position or a lower task. And Jesus demonstrated here a great example of humility in serving other people. So I want you to think about that a little bit as we go through this spiritual gift this morning. I want to start with uh, the general characteristics of a server. A server's basic motivational drive is to demonstrate love by meeting practical needs. A server is diligent and willing to sacrifice his time and energy in order to complete a task. I want to demonstrate a little bit on the board here. I don't know if you like picture, but I like picture as well. We want to get into some of that today as well. A server expresses himself more satisfactorily by doing tangible work. He serves by doing, not by explaining or teaching or discussing or giving or organizing, though he may do some or all those things. This gift is different than many of the other gifts because this is a practical gift. This is one that you use your hands with and often is involved in physical things. A server will often volunteer to serve in church-related or group-related projects, and you can count on him to be one of the people who are still around at the end of the project to see it through to completion. He stays focused on his task and completes it. Somebody has written this about a server. He says, they are the ones washing dishes after we've gone home. They are the ones putting up the chairs while we crawl over them to get to the exits. They are the ones who ask if they can help carry or clean or deliver while everyone else is in their cars heading home. They enjoy the party best if they're in the kitchen or at the barbecue pit or handing out the food. We want to be served. They want to serve. Those are some general characteristics of the spiritual gift of serving. How many of you think you are a server? Okay, that's a good number. Maybe I'll ask that again after some of these. <clears throat> so, number one, a server sees and meets practical needs. Important needs that seem insignificant to others often catch the eye and the attention of the server. These needs are usually physical needs rather than spiritual needs, However, the server knows that by meeting them, he will bring spiritual encouragement and strength to those who receive his help. Paul notes this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20. And we're going to look a little bit at the life of Timothy today because Timothy demonstrates uh, in Scripture this character of serving, this gift of serving, perhaps better than many. Paul says this in Philippians 2, verse 20. He says, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Do you ever ponder that scripture verse? Of all the thousands of people that Paul encountered throughout his ministry, he goes out and makes this statement about Timothy. He says, I have no man like-minded. That's pretty profound. He says, there's nobody that I know that I can depend on like Timothy because I know he's going to naturally care for you. That's the beauty of this spiritual gift. It's exemplary. It's, it, it highlights even the character of Christ. There's no man like-minded to an individual that's fully committed to this gift of serving. The server finds strength in knowing that he's bringing spiritual encouragement 
and strength to those who receive his help. The server is a little bit, um, is, a, is a very practical kind of person. And if you look at some people in scripture, some of the writers, uh, in, especially in the New Testament, you see this gift coming out. One of them that stands out to me is James. When you read the book of James, you know, James has been a controversial epistle uh, throughout history. In fact, Martin Luther called it the gospel of straw. You know, he, he was not very, uh, in, in fact, he wondered sometimes why the book of James was even included in, in scripture. And it's because he had come out of a very works-oriented religion. And here, James is talking about works and the need to see works. And anyways, uh, in James chapter 2, verse 16, James says this, One of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. James says this, What good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So, he, you know, he's almost prophetic in his approach. He's, he's willing to say it like it is. He's saying, you know what? You say you have faith. Well, prove it. I need to see it by works. And that's what a server does. A server is very much like that. He's a practical person who wants to see something physical. He wants to see a demonstration that your Christianity is much more than your words. That you're actually living it out. That in your day-to-day activities, you are demonstrating Christianity by your actions. And you'll see that often in the gift of a server. And in fact, we're going to get into a little bit of the misuse of some of those things a little bit later. But you see the, the practical needs that a server wants to meet. The misuse of this trait, a server can often give unrequested help. Maybe you've been a recipient of that. They can often give unre- uh, unrequested help. Sometimes the needs that the server discerns appear to be more important to the server than they do to the one being served. I want you to think about that a little bit. Sometimes they're more important to the server than the one being served. It may even be that the one who has the needs is not aware of them to the degree that the server is aware of them. In either case, a server who uses his initiative to meet those needs may be judged as pushy or even intrusive. You know what? Let me illustrate a little bit to you. Maybe you're... Let me pick on the ladies a little bit. In your kitchen, in your cabinets, you have a place maybe where you put your things. Your um, utensils, your yashar, whatever, your plates and your cutlery, all these things, your serving dishes. But maybe you're not very organized and they're just kind of all over the place. So a server might come into your kitchen and might say, hey, I'm going to help her out. She doesn't, obviously doesn't really have a whole lot of order in her home. I'm going to help her out. And, and she spends the whole day organizing her kitchen. The next day, the lady whose kitchen was organized comes into her kitchen and tries to find a serving bowl or tries to find cutlery or tries to find an apron. And she has no idea where to look. See, in her her chaos, she understood where everything was. She knew where to find what she needed. And she would have preferred to keep it that way. So a server sometimes gives unrequested help and maybe sees where they can help somebody, but maybe it can even be seen as intrusive. So this kind of seeing and meeting practical needs can also be misused. And that's something that as servers, we need to be careful how we approach a situation. And maybe when we give help that we would maybe request uh, or, or maybe ask if it's even needed before presuming in meeting a need when it may not be required. Number two, frees others to achieve. The joy of the server is not found in the initiation of tasks, but rather in the knowledge that through serving, he is bringing peace of mind to another person, which will allow that person to be more productive in the task God has called him to do. Timothy served Paul so that Paul could carry out his ministry 
to a, a greater extent. In Philippians 2.22, he says, his serving was as a son to the father. So he had a desire to please his father. So his purpose in his ministry was to do uh, things in such a way that Paul could be freed up to become more effective in his own ministry. So you free others to achieve. Your desire in life is, is to help other people to become successful and to be able to minister more effectively. I want to get into the misuse of this trait. Sometimes, because you are so busy doing projects for other people and meeting needs of other people, you let things become too important. In order to meet the needs of other people, servers will often neglect their own homes and their own personal responsibilities. They will meet others' needs but leave their family's needs unmet. This transfer of attention can cause reaction in the server's family. The one being served may feel that too much attention is being put on physical things. Maybe you know of somebody like that that is so focused on serving that they neglect the important things in life. They're so focused on the project, so focused on things that their family becomes neglected. I want to share a very familiar story with you. And I just want to share it with you because I identify with it personally. And I think some of you have too. And it's a very popular story for this reason. Because people can enter into and identify with that. And it highlights the misuse of this trait. So I want to share that with you. A businessman who worked very long hours arrived home one evening to find his seven-year-old son waiting for him at the door. Daddy, yeah, replied the man, Daddy, how much money do you make an hour? Well, son, I don't really think that's any business of yours, the man said. Please, Daddy, please tell me, how much do you make an hour, pleaded the little boy. If I tell you, you must promise you won't tell anybody else. I promise, said the little boy. All right, then, said his father. I make $150 an hour. Oh, the little boy replied. He looked a little sad and said, Daddy, may I borrow $20, please? His father was furious. If the only reason you wanted to know how much money I make is so you can borrow some, you can go straight off to bed. The little boy burst into tears and made his way to his room. After an hour or so, the father had calmed down and went to his son's room. I'm sorry for being so hard on you earlier, son. If you tell me what you wanted the $20 for, and it's a worthwhile thing, I'll think about giving it to you. The little boy ran across the room to his piggy bank and counted out all its contents, exactly $130. $130, that's a lot of money, son. Surely that's enough for what you wanted to buy, said the father. Well, with the $20 you'll give me, it will be, the little boy replied. I'd like to buy an hour of your time. You know, we've heard that story before and we identify with it. And, and I shared it with you because it it strikes a chord with me because I have a seven-year-old boy. And you know what? Sometimes he comes to me and says, Daddy, can you play baseball with me? Daddy, can you pitch to me? Daddy, can you play a game with me? And you know what? Sometimes I'm too caught up in my own projects. And you know what? I do sometimes do these things, but maybe not as often as I could. And you know what? We can get so caught up in projects in meeting the needs of other people that sometimes we neglect our own families. And God's intent and purpose when he gives us spiritual gifts is to not misuse them. To use them in the right way with a sense of balance so that we can honor God by ministering to our families as well. Very, very important. If you have the gift of serving, I really hope you consider some of these things. And that you'll ask God where am I out of balance in my life so that I can serve and not misuse uh, this spiritual gift? Number three, people with a spiritual gift, they often disregard weariness. Because the server sees the importance of the tasks he has begun, he will freely use up personal assets of time, money, and strength his focus is not on himself, but rather on the completion of the task, 
which he knows will benefit others and bring joy to himself. I want to illustrate this through a, a, a scripture passage. If you want to turn with me and follow along in Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 30. And this story that Jesus tells here communicates it perfectly. That sometimes you disregard weariness, which is a great blessing. Um, but it can also have uh, an issue there as well. In Luke 10 verse 30, Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now I want you to consider this. When the Levite passed by this wounded man on the side of the road, the Levite did not have the spiritual gift of serving. He didn't see the need. When the priest came and walked by, he didn't see a need either. He was too focused on his own projects. When the Samaritan came by, he had the gift of serving. Now what I want you to think about a little bit, when you think of the Samaritan, the Samaritan also was on his way somewhere. He also had a role to fulfill. He also had a job to do. He maybe also had business to attend to. But he seen the needs of an individual and was willing to go out of his way to meet them. That's what a server does. You know, I just want to say this because, because sometimes we're, we're harsh on this Levite and this priest when in many ways we're very similar. Maybe we're on our way to our own job. Maybe we're on our way to, to make a, a deal. You know, being in the real estate industry, I, I can understand this. Sometimes if you miss an appointment, you miss a sale. And sometimes if you, you are on your way to a job, you might lose your job. Or you might be demoted in your job because of the compassion that you're able to have for somebody beside the road that needs help. But the Samaritan, what is really beautiful about him, he demonstrates this gift of serving because he was also on his way somewhere. He was also on a business journey. But he took time out of his day, used his personal animal. In modern day, it might be our car, whatever it might be. But he used his personal animal, took him to the motel, and paid for his stay there, plus he paid for his medical bills out of his own pocket. That's the gift of serving. You see that so clearly in that illustration. And it's beautiful. The misuse of this trait, somebody who has the gift of serving, works beyond reasonable physical limits. Inner tension that often results in physical ailments, especially stomach problems, frequently occurs in servers. Interesting thought, eh? Often physical ailments. And you see this in the life of Timothy. This condition may be the consequence of overextending themselves on one job or taking on too many jobs. We know that Timothy had this problem. In 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul instructs Timothy to use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So we know that you know, there was a physical issue that, that Timothy had. And very likely it was because he was um, straining himself too much. He was becoming too active and too involved in the ministry and not taking enough time for rest. And Paul actually encourages him to consider uh, doing something about his physical ailments. But often people that have the spiritual gift, they, 
they take on too many tasks, too many projects, and uh, end up burning out. And so that's a, that's a warning to consider. In Exodus chapter 18, verse 13, it says, The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another. And I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. This is the word that I want you to see. If this is your spiritual gift, focus on this. Because you have the potential to wear yourself out because you're so intent on serving other people. What you are doing is not good. This is biblical. Out of Exodus chapter 13, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. I'm so grateful that in the church, we don't need to do anything alone. That we can depend on each other. That we can minister together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that's the whole beauty of studying the spiritual gifts. So that we can depend and lean on each other. And know that God speaks certain things through somebody else. And uses another individual. Um, even in our lives. And in the, li- in, in the life of the church. To enhance and bless the church. We were not meant to do things our, all on our own. Like Moses did here. We're going to wear ourselves out. And if you're doing that in your life. See this as a warning. Don't burn yourself out. Allow others to help you. Allow others to come on board in your life. Number four, he finds it difficult to say no. As the server effectively meets one need, others may ask for similar help, not realizing the inner motivation of the server. These requests, however, are difficult to turn down because they represent needs, and the server feels obligated to meet the needs since he was asked to do so. You know, that's very um, true when you see it in the church. Very often you see one person doing way more work than they should be doing. And it's often individuals that have the spiritual gift of serving. Because somebody looks at the job that they've done, and they think, hey, John did such a good job. Abe, why don't you ask John to do it? He's so good at it. Not realizing that John has a hard time saying no. He doesn't know how to say no. And so he'll take away time from his family. He'll take away time from, from the priorities in his life that he should be having to go and help another brother and another brother and another sister and, and so on. And will end up making himself weary because he can't say no. So sometimes as, as believers in the church, we need to sometimes examine these things ourselves and maybe not heap too much work on an individual even if we know that they're super good at what they do. Let's consider those things when we ask somebody. Maybe, maybe they're already doing way too much. Maybe they're already close to burnout. So we need to be careful about those kinds of things. The misuse of this trait, um, often this kind of individual can neglect God-given priorities. Servers are often placed in positions of responsibility because they are diligent workers. It is easy for them to volunteer a helping hand or become involved in tasks that they should be delegating to other people. This imbalance causes the server's authority to become frustrated because the original tasks assigned to the server are not completed on schedule. And you might have heard of the expression where somebody says, um, you know, do one thing well. Uh, You're doing a whole bunch of things and you're you're not really doing any of them well. Focus on one thing and do that well. And and that's kind of the attitude of this particular misuse here and what happens here. Um, You know, they become so involved in all these different tasks that they're not really doing anything well. 
you're not really accomplishing anything very good. And uh, you can cause other people to become frustrated uh, in your life because you're taking on so many different things. Learn the word delegation. That means that you don't have to do everything yourself. Sometimes you can ask somebody else to do it for you. That's not wrong. It's not sin. It's not evil. It doesn't mean you're neglecting. See, a server, when he walks into the church, he's looking through his glasses of serving. And he sees needs everywhere. Everywhere he sees needs. And has such a hard time ignoring the needs. But sometimes you need to understand that you're only capable of doing so many things. And it can cause a great imbalance in your life. A server, one of the, the beauties of a server is that they're alert to likes and dislikes. And I think that's kind of fascinating. If you know of somebody that has this gift, they often have an amazing ability to find out and remember the special interests of the people that they serve. Thus, birthdays, anniversaries, and these kinds of things tend to be special occasions to them. And they can even often recall uh, somebody's favorite foods, their favorite dishes, their, their decor in the home, the things that they really like, their types of home furnishings, their favorite activities. And they compile all these things to make an occasion very special for them. And if you have a server in your life and they've ever thrown a birthday party for you, you know that. Because they, they made your favorite cake, they played your favorite game, they, they decorated with the colors that you like, all those kinds of things. When somebody has that kind of gift, um, it's beautiful and it's special and very meaningful. And it demonstrates to you that they care about you, that they remember things about you. And then, you know what? Most of us feel very special when somebody even remembers our birthday or our anniversary, right? It makes us feel loved. It makes us feel appreciated and cared for. A server has the ability to do this. And if you have somebody like that in your life, you're very blessed because they make you feel special. To, uh, um, Paul had this too. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16 says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. You ever heard of Onesiphorus in the scripture? I like this man. Say, he says here, For he often refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me and, and earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. So here was a man that was a refreshing presence to the Apostle Paul. You know, through all the people that complained and made life difficult for him, that were jealous over him, that did all kinds of nasty things to him, here was a man who understood his likes and dislikes. And when this man came into the presence of Paul, he was a refreshing presence to him. You know, I just want to encourage you in the same way. When people come into your presence, are you a refreshing presence to them? Are you like Onesiphorus was here? This man, he says, he was not even ashamed of my chains. And when he came to Rome, he didn't just pretend to look for me. He earnestly looked for me till he found me. Because he wanted to be a refreshing presence to the Apostle Paul. See, somebody that has the spiritual gift of serving is able to be a refreshing presence to people. And we need people like that in the church. We need people like that. And I'm so grateful that we have people like that. The misuse of this trait, a server may react to people around him who in his judgment walk right past obvious needs. So the Good Samaritan would have really um, probably condemned the priest and the Levite for walking by this wounded man on the road. And what I mean, really, in fact, what Jesus was demonstrating in that illustration was that, that we need to be like the Good Samaritan. We need to have that, this gift of serving about us and be willing to see people's needs. But uh, a server will look at 
other people who don't see needs the way they do and will put judgment on them, will cast judgment on them, and, uh, and will condemn them. Because remember, they're looking through these, these serving glasses. In everything that they see, they see needs around them all the time. And it bothers them when other people who have different spiritual gifts don't respond to those needs in the same way. So it's important for us to, to understand that. He can become resentful to those things. And this is beautifully demonstrated in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Mary was distracted with much serving. Mary had the spiritual gift of serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. You know what? Mary had a different spiritual gift than Martha. But a server will look at somebody and will condemn them and judge them when they don't see the needs the way they see them. So it's important for us to not misuse that kind of character trait, uh, but to, to understand that people look at the things that we look at differently. Don't judge them. Don't be harsh. Don't be critical. Understand maybe they're doing something different in the service of the kingdom than you are. Number six, a server needs approval. They need appreciation. Appreciation confirms to the server that his work is necessary and that the Lord is blessing it. The server also desires clear direction. Paul gave Timothy more praise and precise instructions than he gave to any other assistant. And you see that in his life. Uh, you know, Paul was constantly expressing appreciation for Timothy's gifts. A server needs approval. And the misuse of this trait is often they resent when people don't show enough appreciation to them. If a server is given a physical job simply because he is a server and is expected to get his joy from doing it, he may feel misused and react in anger. He may fail to remember that he is working for the Lord. It may, be, it may be tempted to become bitter. In Matthew chapter 25, um, Jesus gives this illustration. He talks about, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. He says, I was naked and you brought clothing to me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. And, and then scripture says there that the righteous looked at him and said, when did we do this to you? And he says, in as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. So his, his, his desire was that his followers would understand that when they serve, they're not doing it unto mankind, but they're doing it as unto him. And if you're feeling underappreciated, if you're feeling like people don't understand and don't even see the gifts that you're doing, the service that you're giving, uh, Recognize that you're doing it unto the Lord. God sees what you're doing. God knows what you're, uh, you know, the, the service that you're doing. Even if no man will see it, God understands what you're seeing. Colossians 3.23 says this, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Because maybe, maybe you've got into this rut where you want attention. You want people to recognize that you're seeing or that you're doing something, that you're serving. You want people to give you some attention. Maybe you've, you've somehow gotten off the rail and you've forgotten that the things that you do, the ministry, the serving that you're supposed to be involved in is as unto the Lord and not unto men. And that's why Paul finds it necessary to mention here, he says, you're not doing this for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, he says. You're not serving men. Sure, you're serving men physically. But you're not doing it so that men will applause you. Nonetheless, I do want to encourage us as a church that when you see people serving in the church, when you see people giving of themselves sacrificially, 
And, and it's happening all around us. I just want to encourage you to take effort to demonstrate appreciation. Say thank you. There's people that have worked, worked for days and weeks on our building project. Put all kinds of hours into, the, into that project over there. And maybe sometimes they're feeling unappreciated. And I just want to encourage you, go up to them and say thank you. Let them know that they're doing a work unto the Lord and that you're noticing it. Or maybe you're better at writing a note of appreciation. Write a little note and put it in their mailbox. Or maybe the people that are cleaning the facility here. Whatever it may be. But there's people that need to sometimes understand that you know, they're appreciated for what they do. A server likes short-range projects. And we're almost done here. <clears throat> the tasks that attract a server are usually immediate needs. The server often becomes frustrated with long-range planning or an ongoing task that seems to make no obvious progress. Timothy was urged to maintain endurance as a good soldier and to continue in the calling that he was given of God. You know, often somebody who has the spiritual gift of serving, they don't like the, the fact that we're going to enter into a two-year project. I mean, that really goes against their nature. They like to meet immediate needs, so you'd rather see them go um, and help in the local community kitchen or something for a day and serve and use their gifts in that way. Or some other short-term projects, maybe helping out at the food bank or something. Or giving to the food bank. And these kinds of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's often frustrating for somebody who has this gift to have the patience to endure and you see that even in the life of Timothy here. To understand, though, that in the working of the kingdom, we need people who have patience and endurance. Because some things are just going to take a long time. Some things are going to drag out. And as a server, you need to understand the importance of prayer. And even to understand how God is seldom early, but he's never late when he responds to your prayer. So the misuse of this trait is that, that uh, you cause people to work around your schedule. Because of the server's lack of desire or ability to properly delegate tasks, he has, a, he has problems delegating, wants to do everything himself, he will often develop his own time schedule and force others to adapt to it. So maybe you know of somebody that likes to be up late at night finishing their tasks and they want to leave the light on. And you can't sleep because they're so task oriented and so project oriented, they want to complete it. And just a note to you if this is what you're doing to your family or this is what you're doing to the loved ones around your life, maybe you are causing people to work around your schedule. And, and that's not kind, it's not courteous, and it's not understanding. And uh, you may hinder your family from feeling involved in your serving. They may actually turn to, they may actually start to um, not enjoy your spiritual gift. They may find an issue with the fact that you're constantly doing these things. And you might cause them to feel taken for granted instead. <clears throat> Number eight, a server adds extra touches to jobs. The server knows that by doing more than is expected, he not only will delight the one being served, but he will also demonstrate that he is doing it unto the Lord. For a server going the second mile might be demonstrated by, um, after, say, say, for example, that you're in charge of mowing the lawn. So maybe after mowing the lawn, you sweep uh, the sidewalks, you clean up all the clippings, you, you do some weed trimming, and you, you go the extra mile. I mean, you were really only hired to mow the lawn. But you do all these extra things because you want to do a job that's done right and done well. Or maybe it's, uh, you know, when you're bringing a gift somewhere, it's tying that extra little bow or putting the little ribbon on, on the gift. You know, some of you may experience that when you're putting gifts under the Christmas tree. And you know somebody who may have this gift of serving because that gift is done perfectly, beautifully. Wrapped so neatly, so carefully, with all the little extras on top. 
And, you know, and then there's the gift that's next to it that uh, is definitely not from the server. <laughs> you sometimes see those kinds of things as well. But uh, uh, a server wants to go above and beyond. And that's uh, often what you see. I was kind of reminded of it this morning. And I think, I think my wife has this gift a little bit too. I, I asked her for a glass of water. And she comes and brings me a glass of orange juice. Uh, which I thought, well, that's way better. That's above and beyond. That's the extra mile. And, you know, just little things like that. You see that when somebody has that kind of spiritual gift, uh, they go the extra mile. They go above and beyond. The misuse of this trait, um, a person is often, uh, a server can be frustrated with time limits and may react to a rigid schedule, not realizing that it is for his own protection. He may feel that it hinders him from the joy of additional serving. And you'll notice that when you're studying the book of uh, First and Second Timothy, twice Timothy was told by Paul not to get sidetracked. Uh, in Second Timothy 4.9, Paul says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. And then in verse 21, he again says, Do thy diligence to come before winter. So twice he exhorts Timothy not to get sidetracked. Uh, and, and that can often happen, too, with somebody who has a spiritual gift. Um, they're frustrated with time limits. They want to do things right. They want to do things well. They want to put on that extra little bowl and on the gift. They want to do the job well, but can get, often get sidetracked by all kinds of other projects. And the last one, meets needs quickly. In an effort to complete tasks, a server will try to avoid committees in what to him appears to be unnecessary red tape. In order to avoid delays, the server will use personal funds. And I want to share a little bit about that because sometimes a server is really, really frustrated when somebody says, let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. Because a server sees needs and he wants it done immediately. No, we don't need to pray about it. Let's just do it. And that's, that's often a spiritual gift of serving. They want to see it done and, and can get really frustrated when somebody says, well, let's spend a month praying about it. And then if God sees us through, then, then we'll go ahead and do this. And, but there's often um, an issue with that. But you see a few men in Scripture who did that. In fact, you see Nehemiah doing that when the, when the walls were being built in Jerusalem. Uh, in fact, he tapped into some of his own resources to get things done quickly. And when you understand the story of Nehemiah, that wall went up really quickly. In fact, in 52 days. Because he had the, this motivational gift of getting things done quickly. You see this also in the life of King David. Uh, when he had a desire to build a temple for the Lord, he used many of his own resources, his own personal bank account, to collect all kinds of resources to build the temple. Because he wanted to see it done quickly. The misuse of this, and the warning that I wanted to just leave you with in this area, is that you can sometimes interfere with God's discipline. That's why it's so great when you have a committee, and you have people with different spiritual gifts in your committee. You have the guy that wants to pray about it, and you have the guy that wants to immediately act. And, and it's great because these two guys can balance each other out. And it's a beautiful thing. But sometimes... If you don't have the guy in the committee that sees the importance of praying about it, you can interfere with what God wants to do in somebody's life. It says, The purposes of God may be frustrated when a server meets a need that God allowed in a person's life to bring about repentance. And if you think a little bit about the story of the prodigal son, what would have happened in the story of the prodigal son if while he was uh, working for this pig farmer, while he was in the pigsty there, what would have happened if an individual had come along and felt sorry for him, and provided food, and clothes, and even shelter for him? Do you think that he might not have gone back to the Father? Because what Jesus was demonstrating in that story was that the Father was God. And sometimes, God allows us to go into the pigsty in order to bring us to repentance. But sometimes, somebody with a spiritual gift of serving intervenes and interferes and gets in the way of what God is doing. And I have 
I've personally witnessed this in my own life. I've witnessed a man who I seen God wanting to bring to repentance. Who I see I seen that God was judging him. I seen that that there were some severe consequences in his life because of some of the actions that he was doing. And then I seen another person who had sympathy and compassion on him and intervened and interfered in his life. And to this day, that man still is walking in unrepentant life and is not serving the Lord. And it just opens my eyes to see that. Uh, that sometimes when we feel compassion and we feel sympathy for somebody, um, it's sometimes misplaced. Sometimes we need to wait before we act. Sometimes we need to spend time in prayer before we go forward and intervene in what God is doing in that person's life. Maybe God is doing a step-by-step -step process in his life to bring him back to himself. And God is gracious that way and great in that way. So I didn't want to encourage you in that way. So that's all. Are you a server? Who, who thinks after this that you're a server? Yeah, that's good. You know, I am excited for that because God wants to use you in the church here. I hope you, you take to heart some of the misuses of this in that you apply the benefits and the great things about the gift of serving. I hope I haven't highlighted too much the misuses. But I, I did want to share them because they're very real and they happen. And, and I hope you're motivated and encouraged because sometimes servers are looked at as people who do all the low-down tasks. But I want to encourage you that that's not the case. Because, uh, you know, Jesus said, a cup of cold water given in my name will not go unnoticed. And, and you know, whatever you do, maybe you see them as low, but they are no different. And they are done as unto the Lord. And I want to close with a little quote here by Martin Luther King. He says, If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep the streets, even as Michelangelo painted, or Beethoven composed music, or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, Here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you care about us. We thank you for the spiritual gift of serving. Father, we pray that you would guide us as individuals. Lord, that we would not misuse this gift. But Lord, that in confidence and in full assurance, we would go forth expressing this gift that you've given us. Lord, we pray that you would protect us from the wiles of the enemy. Protect us, Lord, from walking in the flesh according when we think of this gift that you've given us. But Lord, I pray that you would, you would help each one here who sees in themselves the gift of serving, that they would apply these biblical truths to their lives and become more resourceful, become to, to live a life that's more fulfilling, Lord, to live a life according to the full potential that you've given them, Lord. Oh, Father God, help them to enter into this, into this gift, and use it to their utmost, Lord. Help them to reach out to you for strength, Lord. And Father, you will give them the strength. You will give them the ability, <clears throat> day by day, hour by hour, to use this gift effectively in your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would just bless uh, this, Lord. And bless the word, Father, as we've studied it here this morning. And guide us, Lord. Even those of us who may not have the gift and may not understand what motivates these servers, Lord. But Lord, I pray that today we'll have understood it even more and that we'll uh, be able to bless them and show appreciation to them and, and be there for them, Lord. And I thank you for what you will do in the church. Thank you for building the church. Thank you, Lord, that you are the master builder and that as we build, Lord, around the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ, Lord, that we will do it well because you're giving us knowledge to do these things effectively. And we thank you for what you will do in Jesus' name. Amen.